Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel discussion on mental health representation in video games. My name's Paul Fletcher. I'm a psychiatrist and a researcher at Cambridge University, and I spend a lot of my time trying to understand how the brain or the mind makes sense of the world around it um, with varying degrees of success. Um, I feel very, very fortunate and privileged to host this panel, which has a broad and deep range of talent, expertise, and experience. And I see my primary job as you hearing far more from them than you do from me. But I would like to just frame the overall discussion um, by recollecting some words that the great Mira Sayal spoke when she received her BAFTA fellowship very deservedly about 10 days ago. She said, um, when you hear someone's story, you stand in their shoes. They are no longer an other or a stranger or a statistic. They're as complex and human as you are. And I think that's a very important way of framing the discussion that we're about to have. Video games are often about stories. Um, and they're stories that are quite interesting in a way because we are, recip we are recipients but also participants in video game stories. And I think that can be a very powerful tool in how we can represent mental health and mental ill health. So with no further... Uh, prevaricating on my part, I'd just like to ask my panel to introduce themselves. And I'll start with Jane here. Hello there, my name is Jane Perry, and I'm an actor and a voice actor. And I've been in quite a few uh, games. I've sort of lost track, but let's say 60 or so. And um, uh, I won a BAFTA for my performance in Returnal. I played a character named Celine in a game called Returnal. And um, I've also played characters in Cyberpunk and Hitman, As Dusk Falls, and, and many, many others. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about this particular subject. Great. Thank you, Jane. Emma. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emma Taylor. I um, work in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust as their Recovery College Manager and Peer Support Professional Lead. Uh, and I'm delighted to be working alongside Don with Ninja Theory um, in collaboration with, um, we supported with Hellblade, um, but also with Project Mara as well. Thank you. Thank you. Gareth. Uh, I'm Gareth Damian Martin, uh, otherwise known as the studio Jump Over the Age. I'm the developer of uh, In Other Waters and more recently Citizen Sleeper. Thank you. And Dom? Uh, I'm Dom Matthews. I'm studio head at a studio called Ninja Theory. Um, I think the most relevant game for this panel is Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which told the story of um, a Celtic warrior and her experiences of psychosis. Thank you very much. So as you can see, we've got a huge breadth of, of talent to talk about mental health representation in games. Um, I'd just like to throw out a, a general question uh, to start with for the panel as a whole, which is, aren't games supposed to be fun? This is some very dark um, areas that you take your games to, with, star in my view, startling results. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think games are supposed to be, uh, or I don't think games have to be fun. I'm very comfortable that Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is not a fun game. It's quite raw, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's compelling, mm. I think. Um, I think it's too simplistic to think that every game, in the same way that every film or every book or every theatre production is not necessarily fun. They can evoke a range of different emotions and feelings in their viewers or their players, and I think it's the same for games. And I think, as I say, Hellblade is, is not fun, it is raw. Um, but it's compelling, and I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think compelling is quite a good word as well for it, really. Or I, I would think of like engaging as well in terms of how I think. I, I kind of come from games from outside of games, mostly from working in theatre and literature and other places, and only came to games in my 30s. And I don't think I ever asked myself how my games would be fun. <laughs> I don't think I, that's a question I ever thought about. Um, I only ever kind of started with a thematic thing that I wanted the game to be about and then ways to dig into that and make that engaging to kind of unwind that, open it up, unpick it and find what's compelling about it, what's interesting about it and draw that out of it. That was, that's kind of what I sit down to do when I sit down to make games. So 
Um, that might, you know, in some cases that might be fun, right? That might be what you're picking out of it might be fun, but in my case it really is. Um, but yeah. Thanks. So compelling rather than fun. I, I think I'll buy that. Yeah. So let's start the conversation with Emma, if you don't mind. So as someone, to some extent, on the sharp end, um, we talk about honest and good representations oh. in, in games, and, and this is something that uh, Gareth raised when I spoke to them uh, last week, or earlier this week, which is, you've got the re representation there, but what's it for? What are you doing with it? So I'd like to ask you, what do you think good representations in games can do? I think for me, um, we have a, a responsibility, really, if we are going to sort of start talking about mental health and how we sort of represent that within gameplay. Um, and there are lots of stats out there around mental health and, and diagnosis, and I'm sure we've all heard about the one in four. Um, but for me, I feel truly that we all have mental health and we all have mental health challenges as part of our daily life. So actually, mental illness is a common part of the human experience. So I think, why shouldn't games show that? I think it's so important. As you say, they're in books, it's in theatre, it's in music. Um, I think, however, mental health representation with games has got to be done correctly. So we've seen in Hollywood about how it can be, it can actually sort of create inaccurate stereotypes. Um, and I think that just further kind of adds to the stigma that, that people with mental health challenges um, experience. So I think if we are going to represent ourselves, it's got to be done in a genuine, valid and, and really sort of sensitive way. And maybe compelling is, is that way that actually mental health isn't pretty. Um, sometimes it's, it's far from it. Um, but actually it is a normal experience that we, we all go through at, at some point. And I think what's been done so beautifully and being part of this panel is being able to listen to the voices of peers. So people that are living with and, and going through experiences, just as myself, as I am today, um, and making sure that we use those voices to guide that representation. I think that's, that's so key. Um, and I think stigma has changed a lot um, over probably the past 10 or 15 years. Um, but I still think there is a definite need to, to continue working um, on how we represent ourselves, um, or people with mental health challenges, rather. And I think you just have to look into the media that if there's a, a serious crime, <clears throat> usually the um, headline will allude to some sort of mental health challenge. Um, and that, again, feeds into this idea that people with mental health are dangerous um, or scary. And I think what becomes even um, harder is that people that are then living with those challenges can start to believe that and, and internalise that and create self-stigma. So I think it's got to be done really balanced and in a really accurate and fair way. Right, thank you. And you raised the point about self-stigma. And I think one of the really heartening things, certainly about Hellblade and, and Returnal, is that the heroes who are clearly struggling are very much heroes. You know, they are people that you would... Exactly. aspire to emulate. And I think that's that's so important that if we are representing mental health, it can't be that they're always um, the weak person. Do you know what I mean? That they're mm. always going to be mm. downtrodden. Actually, as you say, Senua, um, she is saving the soul of her loved ones. She has a story alongside her experiences. Um, and at times she's brave, at times she's vulnerable, at times she's weak, and at times she's you know, a warrior princess in my mind. <laughs> um, and I think it's about how we keep that balance. So we're not putting sort of toxic positivity out there, but we're also not saying it's the end of the world. Um, and I think it is about role modeling that hope that people can live well with those different challenges. And what I love about Senua is in combat, her voices help her as well as them causing you know, some really challenging experience and moments, there are times when those voices help her and support her. And I think that's um, really helpful. Thank you very much. Mm. So turning to Dom, I mean, it was a few years ago that you and your studio took the bull by the horns and made a risky decision to represent a very clear mental illness. Um, what, what are the challenges facing that? And what, you know, how did you face it? Well, I think as soon as we realized uh, that we wanted to tell uh, this story of someone who experiences psychosis, the next step was really to make sure that we understood the subject um, as much as we possibly could. So I think that that in itself was a challenge, is, is making sure that we understood um, what psychosis meant, what, it, what the experience was like. Um, and that really took two forms. That was understanding the neuroscience and working with you, Paul, to really understand how the brain functions and um, how we all um, interpret the world around us. And then working with the college and, and other groups to understand um, lived experience, um, really with the aim of creating a, 
um, a character and a story that could be a, a real person. So I think one of the one of the challenges is um, to um, to uh, understand the subject, but also to try and break through a lot of the complexity within those subjects. Mm -hmm. We didn't create a a blueprint of psychosis in Hellblade. Um, and it would have been impossible to, to do so as we worked through speaking to people with lived experience and speaking to, to people within the mental health community. There's a lot of very different perspectives on mm. psychosis. Mm. For some people, it would be categorized as, um, as an illness, a mental mm -hmm. illness. To others, it would be an unshared reality. So I think one of the, one of the challenges is to choose your story, choose your path and to be brave in that, knowing that it's not going to represent everyone, but it's representing a story and a, and a person that could be a real person going through the, those experiences. Thank you. So um, clearly there's, there's work in creating the story, but then you do need the people to bring it to life. And so I'd like to turn to you, Jane, because I think that um, what I've seen of Returnal, it's an amazing and, and disturbing evocation of trauma and memory and rewriting memory and re-exploring memory and a sort of journey of discovery, really. And the, the, the central character, Celine, is, is an amazing hero, but also um, she has an amazing voice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a voice that I imagine must have taken a huge amount of work to create and to allow to evolve through the game. So I'd love to hear from you how you set about this. Well, uh, very much so in collaboration with Housemark, the developer of Returnal. Um, and I feel like they had a great sensitivity towards this character and her particular struggles. And she is, is a hero, but she's um, also, um, I suppose you could use the word flawed. In other words, she's a human being who has her challenges, her strengths, and, and uh, perhaps things that she needs to work on. Um, so in terms of approaching that, uh, I, I really, you know, in my sessions, one of the lovely things about Returnal was that we really took our time in the sessions when we were recording, which um, as a voice artist is not always the case. Sometimes you, um, you know, if you're just recording voice, you're in there and you're bang, 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 you go through as quick as you can because time is money. But they really took their time to really explore how to find the sweet spot of where the character is at at any given moment. So sometimes she's incredibly strong, and then as, as her journey progresses through the game, she sort of descends into, uh, I think, quite poor mental health. Um, and, um, and we found um, a way to articulate where she is at in the process. In other words, how mentally uh, disturbed she is with um, a sort of a numerical association with, um, how shall I put it? She keeps coming back to the same place over and over and over again. And every time she comes back, her mental state is, is, is uh, frayed. So we would attach a numerical value as to how many times she's returned to this trauma. And, um, and then I would play the uh, kind of impact uh, of that. And that allowed us to kind of keep track of where mm. she was in the process, because of course, as you probably all know, it's, it's not always a chronological uh, process to record a game. So that was really um, a smart approach. But in terms, you know, also of, of uh, her trauma and such, uh, we would have really important and um, rich conversations around exactly what was going on and what was impacting her and and what was affecting her. So it gave me a very um, sort of safe set of guidelines to follow with her, and it gave me some boundaries uh, to work within, which uh, as a performer I think is quite important because you, you know, there is the potential sometimes for your own psyche to get a little bit melded with your characters. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for the performer that can be mm, challenging mm. and dangerous. Yeah, sometimes. and I'd, I'd definitely like to come back to that mm. actually. Thank you. So turning to Gareth, um, I mean, for me, Citizen Sleeper is an incredibly powerful evocation, uh, both viewing it as a, as a neuroscientist and as a psychiatrist, that you, th this idea of somebody, a be bewildered individual, trying to husband limited resources within a very hostile and uncertain and risky environment is so much part of the clinical situations we find ourselves in. Um, 
And I'd just like to hear you say a bit more about this. How did, how did you, well, not how did you come up with it, that's rather trite, but <laughs> what, what was motivating you to tell this story in, in this way? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously comes from, for me, from my experience, and Citizen Sleeper is kind of, after having made one game and that game been successful enough for me to make a second game, I kind of felt like, well, I don't know if that will ever come around again, so I want to make the game that I've been thinking about making, which is also kind of, consequently, was kind of like also the novel that I was thinking about writing, and the, at one point was a graphic novel I was thinking about writing. It was kind of, it was something that had been kind of like worming away in my mind based on my experience of, um, mental health, basically my experience of, of suffering from clinical depression, um, my experience of depersonalization as part of that as a very particular symptom, um, but also my experience of trying to work and live in a city, um, and especially within the gig economy, working zero hours contracts or you know, working uh, for employment agencies where they would kind of randomly give you. And it's, it's interesting, you, know, you, you talked about the kind of measuring the mental state, and it's a funny thing about video games is that Unfortunately, everything has to have a number attached. So as nuanced mm -hmm. as you want to be, you're at the end of the day, it's a variable. Mm. And in Citizen Sleeper, a lot of um, what the game is, is about tracking resources mm. and variables and having variables represent you. So if you haven't played the game, um, in the game you play as a, an android who um, has a, a, is a copy of a human consciousness inside an artificial body and they had this horrible experience basically they were created to work for a corporation and they escape from that situation and end up in a space station that's kind of unlegislated and they're trying to live <laughs> there but they have a their body is collapsing all the time unless they have the corporate made supplement that uh, they would require to live when they were working for the corporation and they have to now find that on the black market mm. and survive but the way that the game represents um, your daily life is that each day you roll a certain number of dice and that number of dice are the things that you can do in that day. So you assign those dice to different actions, whether that's taking a shift at a local bar or helping a friend, babysitting a child, or it could be something more extreme, like trying to investigate um, the disappearance of a doctor or you know, much bigger kind of storylines. Um, and so the game is constantly asking you to deal with the kind of random amount of energy in each day, which is also declining over a longer period. And I think that kind of maths of... Um, existing in a, a labor economy where you might wake up one day and have so much energy but you have no shifts or jobs available to you and you've just got to you've got to do something with that versus waking up and knowing that you have uh, a double hour a double shift of 12 hours and you've all you've done is rolled a set of ones was kind of the 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 thing i was trying to get at and mm. so the, the process of making the game was very much about trying to understand how to systematize that and that can be a very fraught, I think, and complicated experience because it feels, it can feel crude and kind of limited. Um, but I think mm. what I found and what kind of brought me through it was the, the using dice, which are kind of inherently abstract object, allowed me to abstract the, the experience. So it, it was no longer a kind of metaphor, but instead was building a kind of setup that, that would create the, um, the experience without kind of... Um, making a metaphor of the experience. It was, you know, a, as a player of the game, when you roll a set of ones, you feel a certain way, right? And when you, especially when you've got really important things mm. to do plot-wise on that day, you feel a certain way. And that, I, you know, what I'm creating then is the feeling of playing the game as opposed to a metaphor that you can kind of look at and say, oh yeah, that's just like depression, but something that actually somehow, at least that's the aim, like it inspires that, that kind of same um, emotional response or, or puts people in that place um, or maybe for people feels familiar mm. right if they've experienced those things they feel connected to the character because they're like yes that i have had those days you know yeah um so yeah that that has been, that has been the process of kind of citizen sleeper and, and how i got to got to it mm. fascinating and you know you're quite diffident about boiling it down to numbers but Actually, I think I, as you were speaking, I was realizing one of the things that really appealed to me as a neurobiologist, neuroscientist, is the central idea that a lot of people have that um, you know, the principle of survival is energy management. Um, if we fail to manage our energy, then we just degenerate into entropy. And so our sole preoccupation, whether a single-celled animal or head of a corporation, is to manage energy. And I, I think mm. somehow you, you've got at that fundamental truth in a really compelling way. Um, 
So moving on, uh, Emma, back to, back to you. you. You've touched on this already, but I'd really like to hear you say a little bit more about what, what do you think is a good representation? It's an, it's an awful question, but I'm sure you're up to it. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> you might need to rein me in. I think it's, it's interesting because what's good and what's bad, and I think for good, it's got to be helpful. Um, and again, I, I allude to things being helpful around what Dom said about getting that voice and getting those different experiences. So I think that's key, is um, ensuring that we do hear from as many different people that are going through um, as many different experiences as possible, because I wouldn't want to say just because my experience of ASD is my experience, that means that everybody's experience is the same. Mm. Um, sorry if I'm going off on a tangent. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, but I think good representation can really help normalise and even maybe demystify um, mental mm. health because mm. I don't think many people are innately stigmatising. I think there's a lack of knowledge or understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that can um, cause people to become um, maybe confused or, or curious even. Um, and so if we can have sort of um, more accurate representation, I think it's educating people, um, which is key, I think, to, to reducing that stigma. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as I say, when I first became poorly, I felt like I was the only person that was going through this and I, I didn't see myself within anybody else. So I think if we are having that representation in games, as I think you've already alluded to, it makes you think, OK, it's not just me. Actually, I can see similar traits in, in the character. And I think that's really, really helpful as well. Thank you very much. I've got more. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep moving around. But that, that is really helpful, actually. Um, and I think it demonstrates that the stakes are high. Um, and Dom, turning to you, the stakes are high, but the risks are also very high, I think. You know, when I produce a scientific paper, the worst that can happen is that nobody reads it. And in fact, that happens a lot of the time, if I'm perfectly honest. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. But, <laughs> you know, to, to take this risk with dealing with such a sensitive subject in such a public forum requires some courage. I just wonder, you know, how do you see those risks? How do you manage them? How do you... Do what you want to do. I mean, you don't want edutainment. Mm. You want a game that people want to play as a game. So where does that sort of come from? Yeah, I, th I, think, you, uh, I think for us, and uh, it's being clear on what your intentions are, and our intention was actually never to, um, to necessarily have a mental health impact. Our intention was to tell, um, to make a really compelling game. Like our aim was to make a great game that told a great story that happened to be about someone experiencing psychosis. And the thought was, if we got that right, then kind of as a byproduct of the game, mm -hmm. then maybe we will have an additional impact. Um, so I think, there's a, I think there's a risk and there's a balance to be had, which has already been touched upon, of uh, this nice kind of spot where, where lived experience and, and, uh, and science meets, meets video games. Um, I think I've spoken to a lot of um, developers and a lot of organizations that have said, great, I've seen what Hellblade has done and other games. We want to go and make a, a mental health game. And really what they want to make is, is kind of a textbook in a, in, a, in a video game form, which is, is, is going to be very, very educational, but no one's going to want to play it. The other end of the scale is that really you want to use mental health as a vehicle to sell your game. So then what you really end up doing is creating the game that you want to make and then maybe you'll engage with people to kind of make sure you've ticked the boxes so you're not going to uh, offend anyone. Mm. So I think there's a challenge to, to find the, 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 the right spot on that spectrum. Mm. And for us on Hellblade, it was, we felt confident um, in, in the game because of that, that, those collaborations that we'd had. But I think for us, we found that magic, which was incredible collaborators that meant that what we were, um, what we were doing was not just understanding the subject, but we were finding that the subject was so creatively rich that it could inform the experience that we, that we wanted to, to make. So I think to, to, to answer your question, you, you have to be brave. There's a lot of inherent risks mm. in what you're doing. But I think if your intentions are right, and that is to create a truthful, compelling experience that players are going to want to play, you have a better chance of doing, as, as you've talked about, of reducing stigma by educating people through a truthful journey and, and experience. Right, so people have to want to listen to the story um, yes. in the first place. Yeah. 
Thank you. So just taking this theme of risk and, and moving to you, Jane, and it's something you alluded to earlier, which is when you go to this dark place in a sincere way that you're really exploring it, it must be tough. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of different, uh, I suppose, approaches to acting. Um, you know, one of which is to just sort of kind of have a outside in approach where you are maybe not living through the experience so much, but you really are just acting, you know. And then there's other actors who really take an inside in a, a, a inside approach to it, where they really take on the character and feel what the character's feeling and really reflect and, and contemplate sort of what's going on. And uh, I sort of put myself more in that category. Not that I'm method or anything like that, but I just find that in order to um, find the truth of the character, I feel like I have to bring myself to the character. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, when it's a character like Celine or, or, or somebody who's perhaps troubled or what have you, it can um, kind of tr trigger, I suppose, some of these feelings that I have in my own being. And I've realized throughout the course of my career that um, it's very, very important to find a way to take care of one's own psyche through these experiences when you're playing a role that is perhaps more difficult. Now in a, a different setting, for example, maybe a stage production or what have you, um, you might be going through this experience with a number of other people and you can support yourself in that. And, and actually now, I think they do have um, therapists, you know, on site for um, productions <coughs> that are happening on the stage or in film or what have you, to help people deal with some of the issues that might arise due to the content. Uh, but my experience uh, being a sort of a solo voice artist in the voice booth is that you really do have to be mindful of that for yourself. And when I talk about acting in games, um, if I'm teaching or, or just having a conversation with somebody about it, uh, it's always something that I bring up, that we have to engage in a, a self-care um, because it, it does resonate. We can, unbeknownst to ourselves, bring home some of the trauma without even realizing it. And then suddenly, you know, you're talking about energy, you wake up one day and you think, I don't, I don't have any energy, I'm completely spent, I'm a spent force. A and it's because you haven't taken those little steps throughout the process to really uh, be mindful of your actor self and, and, and to uh, address some of the more difficult things that, that you're taking on board when you play, you know, these sorts of roles. So it, right. it's fascinating. I think yeah. our psyche, I don't, maybe w you have something to say about this, but I sometimes wonder if my psyche as, a, as an actor doesn't really know the difference between me sort of acting something and really being in it. You know, so <laughs> that's your next <laughs> academic paper. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone would actually read that. <laughs> no, that is fascinating. Does, does anyone else have anything to say on that? Because you're all in your, you know, from different perspectives, going to these places and investing yourself in them. I mean, it, it does take. Yeah, I mean, that rings very, as a solo developer, it rings very true mm -hmm. with me, right? It's that a, a huge amount of my job is also managing myself because I do almost all the roles in making my video games. So that means that I'm my greatest resource, but that means also if I stop, everything stops. And so that balance of kind of being able to manage um, my own mental health, but also the environment and what, what making something um, difficult brings up in me has been very important, especially for... Um, Citizen Sleeper, I mean, writing the, there's lots of different endings in the game, and writing those endings was one of the hardest things I had to do because they would, there was a certain level of vulnerability that I had to access in order to produce that work. And I knew when I was doing it that if I didn't open myself up to that level of vulnerability, then th it wouldn't work. The, the, those moments just wouldn't, what I wanted them to, to hit on, there's some of those mm. moments. You know, there's one way you kind of d decide between spoilers. Sorry, um, <laughs> you you I'll, I'll vaguely I'll put it in vague terms. You kind <laughs> of decide whether you would like to kind of dissolve uh, and kind of atomize yourself into a, a kind of natural environment, or whether you'd like to remain a person and a, a coherent individual with all of the complications that your life has already brought, which is has in the game is a life which is filled with a lot of suffering. Um, and you have to make that decision. Mm. And writing that was, <laughs> and really engaging with that is, of course, very dangerous and very, mm. a very serious proposition. Um, having, you know, and having been through those experiences in my past and having thought about those ideas, I think that was very hard. But it was also, I think that the, the vulnerability, you know, it's a, 
it's a real type rope walk because the vulnerability that I, the vulnerability of Citizen Sleeper as a project for me, I think is what has allowed people to align themselves with the experiences of the character. And if I had not mm. done that, I don't think that people would be responding to it in the same way. I don't think that people would, you know, I was amazed to see the response to the game and see so many people from very different backgrounds as well. People, I, I don't consider myself to have uh, a, a chronic disability and people coming from that background and saying, well, this is incredibly relevant to me and actually mm. I feel incredibly aligned and I feel um, seen in this, in this experience and I, I found it very meaningful was incredibly powerful for me as well because I was like, well, I didn't just make it and kind of put it in well and knew exactly what it was. I needed people to play it and, and kind of like meet me in that place of vulnerability. Mm. And I think that is also a big part of, of you know, to talk about the wider subject of this talk uh, uh, is that the idea that in a way like to, to find each other as people who suffer from from various you know mental health difficulties illnesses um, or just you know who suffer from life um, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we have to find each other somehow and the only way we can do that is in a vulnerable place you know we can't find that by reinforcing ourselves and I think that can seem very impossible in um, the circumstances we find ourselves in often. It often mm -hmm. feels like we have to fortify ourselves constantly against attack, preemptively perhaps, in case we made a mistake. And you know, like, like with um, making Hellblade, right? That you, there's a sense of like, we have to pre-fortify the representation mm. in case somebody has a problem with it. Mm. And so it's mm. such a, there's such an interesting balance there, yeah. I think, that's happening across all of this work that's kind of like this combination of trying to be precise and accurate, but also ultimately having to be vulnerable. That mm. you, without that vulnerability, it's not gonna, it's not going to have that spark that's actually going to connect with people's experience. Mm. Yeah. That's really interesting um, framing. And it's making me think about um, something that Emma raised earlier, this notion of toxic positivity, because I, I think mental health awareness is a good thing. We're all agreed. But one sometimes sees it as a way, essentially, of rooting the problem in the person who has failed to take the necessary steps, whether that's you know, fail to engage in the self-care or, or whatever. And I just wonder, um, is that part of the balance? Is there a danger of, you know, in representing these things, is there a danger that we are inadvertently placing unrealistic expectations on people? When in fact, as Citizen Sleeper shows, that a major problem is not the disembodied mind being pathological. It's the, the situation within which the person exists and trying to manage the needs of the physical side with a hostile environment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's a, that's a huge part of what Citizen Sleeper kind of is about, right? Is about the, all parts of those conditions that I was modeling from my own experience. So not just my own mental health difficulties, but also like the, the, the structural existence I was inside, right? And society around me and the, the uh, thing I talk about a lot with Citizen Sleeper, which is the feeling of being a tiny thing and there's this huge machine whirring machine that's whirring nearby and you might just get caught in it you know mm. it might just but it would never know that it caught you and and you would have no you have no agency in relation to that mm. and it is it does feel absurd sometimes to me to talk about the tiny the responsibilities of the tiny person versus the responsibilities of the massive whirring machine you know that it, it's kind of like it, I agree that there is a an issue with kind of focus on mental health of, of it becoming isolated from, uh, like I said, suffering from life, right? From life, from, mm. from the structural context which it takes mm. place in. And I, th I think that's very important to me. I yeah. would never want somebody to place it as a sleeper and be like, oh, you know what? I just need to manage my dice better. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. And yeah. The, the, the message is the opposite, which is that you can, yeah. you know, you have to put it, it says in Sleeper, at least, you know, that I'm exploring the idea of how you have to put your faith in other people around you and you have mm. to find other people in that place of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, that it can't be about, it, it's not about controlling the system or, or even breaking it, um, but it's about building something that you can, mm. that gives you agency and, and control and a sense of, sure. sense of meaning. Um, so, yeah, I think, but I think that's a very important issue, actually, for, for mental health representation more generally, is that it's not just well, look, here, this person's mm. sick, you know, and, <laughs> and, yeah. that's no, and that's their fault, or that's to do only with them. That's yeah. only to do with them, mm. I guess. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I am keen to throw it open so that people get an opportunity to ask questions in the last 10 minutes, but I'd just like to reflect it back to others, including you, Emma. You raised this idea of toxic positivity. 
Gareth's comment? Um, I mean, does it chime with you? Yeah, definitely. I think if we're going to talk about representation in games, it can't just be, as you say, it can't just be that the person is the problem because that isn't, I think, realistic in life. Um, and there is so much around a person that, that supports them or hinders them or challenges them. Um, I'm going off a wee bit, but no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And I think just going back onto a point that you mentioned earlier about that vulnerability, I think the vulnerability is key um, to getting the essence of what we're trying to do, I think, across this panel. Um, and I think it's, it's how we manage to work that as, as a team um, that's so key, because without that vulnerability, I think, as you say, we are we're meant to be resilient beings, do you know what I mean? And we're meant to sort of protect ourselves at all points, yet here we are asking people to share some of the most inner most deepest sort of feelings and thoughts. Um, so I just wanted to sort of echo that as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, and, and I have also should say that I feel like I have a slight like ch cheat side of it because I, I'm a solo developer and that actually, while I said, okay, that's difficult, but it also gives me a certain capability for just being able to say, okay, well, I, I'm the organizer, I'm the thing here so I can talk about my experience. But I, well, you mentioned a team and that's the part that I really admire actually is, is being able to achieve those effects across a team. Um, and, and that's I think that's a, a huge achievement to be able to make that reasonable because you can't possibly have everybody share the experiences. And so you actually mm. have to find a way of making it work, which yeah, is mm. really challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's something that's come across very strongly, Jane, in, in interviews I've seen you give and, uh, and also today. This, it's, a, it's a team job sometimes. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think that is, is so true. And um, <coughs> And I, I think it's so important for everybody to be on the same page because, I, and, and I love that how much you talk about this idea of vulnerability. I really think that that's where it, it needs to come from that that place. Um, otherwise, I don't think audiences relate to it uh, so much, and we have to risk that vulnerability. But it's so hard to risk being vulnerable if you feel like there's even just one person who's mm. maybe not on board, mm. you know, with the whole vision. That can be quite destabilizing in a way. And I think mm. we feeling safe uh, is so deeply important when we're creating a anything really. Um, yeah, and, and you know, it's. This idea of uh, disability theory, where there's this, you know, the sense of a person being disabled. Well, no, they're 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 an able person in a world that disables them, and I think that games, you know, and you've, I think it sounds like your game is very much about this. How it shows the world that disables us, or it's games are are able to show the environment that then has this huge impact on the character, and we can really, you know draw those connections between how we are in the world and the world that we live in. And I think that that is so important as well. Yeah, it reminded me very much, um, Martin Amos, who sadly died yesterday, um, said that literature concerns itself with the internal, cinema with the external. Now, he didn't say what games concern themselves <laughs> with, but it sounds yeah. like it's the interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, um, I, are you happy for me to throw it open for questions? Mm. I, I feel sure that people will have some. Hi, um, this one's for Jane. I really appreciated what you spoke about regarding setting up boundaries for yourself as an actor within the room. And it's like what you said, it's money is time. And it's quite a high pressure environment, especially when you're expected to do it in as little takes as possible. I was just wondering, do you have any advice about setting up those boundaries to protect your mental health because um, there's a lot of pressure to also deliver an authentic performance and there's a lot of sensitivity re regarding uh, portraying mental health as an actor mm. and yeah i was wondering if you'd have any advice regarding that i think uh, awareness is is key mm. knowing that you can be profoundly affected and even damaged by the content that you're playing is really key. And it's, it's so interesting to me how, um, you know, actors can sort of have a cavalier uh, approach about this uh, and uh, making an assumption that we can dive into this dark territory and just pop out at the end and, and you know, be fine. And, um, and, and, and sometimes we can do that and it's okay. But just to have the awareness that this might have impact on me. So your preparation is knowledge 
about the Im the psychic, the psychological, I should say, impact of the jobs that we do, and and to take that seriously, and then to take responsibility for your own health at the end of a session or filming or whatever it is you're doing, uh, and to take time to uh, w what they call in drama therapy is to de-roll, to just let go of the role, which usually for me, and I suppose everybody's different, but for me it has to do with having some sort of ritual that allows me to step out of that character and back into my own life. And if little issues come up, to then address them, to really take some time to reflect on, okay, why am I feeling upset about this or angry or what have you, and, and, and to just to take some time to inquire into what it's brought up in me and, and, and to, um, I suppose, face that. Uh, so that would be, you know, my, my top tip. <laughs> That's very <laughs> eloquently so put. My pleasure. Um, can I also reflect it to Dom? I mean, as somebody who manages isn't, and has responsibility for a large group of people working in a difficult place with the games you make, what steps can the company take? I mean, I, I do get a sense that Ninja Theory have a very healthy working atmosphere, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I, I think I know there's been a lot of discussion about it today around, around burnout and, um, and, and the challenges there. I think, uh, I think it's being mindful. Like uh, over the last five years, I would say, there's been far more growth in, in discussion around mental health within, within the games industry. We're at a point now, certainly at Ninja Theory, where people uh, will we'll be comfortable saying that I need to take a day out because I'm, I'm not in the best place mentally, mm -hmm. which I think is a huge step. I mean, when I started my career, no one would ever say that. So mm. I think it's playing our role in the industry to move these things forward. Um, and it's just being mindful that really, um, for us as a studio, Ninja Theory is our people. We're, we're p people and a bunch of computers. Mm. And, and with enough money, we can replace computers. But what we are are our people, and we need to look after that, that very precious resource and, and be mindful that um, we want people to work you know, effectively and efficiently. But we're in a, I think we're moving into a place now where people can have far better um, work-life balances and, and we will prove out that that will lead to even better, uh, more compelling games. Thank you very much. Are there, there's a hand raised in the second row from the back. Um, this question is directed foremost at Gareth for a reason which will become obvious in two seconds. Um, Oh dear. <laughs> games I'm have gonna... for a long time been very good at um, the, the mental ill effects of things like grief and loss of family or a home or friends um, or of war, conflict. Um, but one thing that I think is relatively underrepresented is the mental ill effects of um, the kind of things that probably a lot of people in this room have been through where you have to work a job which is just a drudgery and takes a toll on you and is not where you want to be and you kind of struggle to walk through the door every morning etc um, there are games which do touch on this like yours um, my question is how well do you think games generally are doing at tapping into what is a very a very universal feeling of kind of having your mental health eroded by just the drudgery of labor and being exploited by capitalism and bad bosses and bad work and bad companies. Um, one example that sticks out for me is in um, What Remains of Edith Finch, where there's one of the family members who's working like the fish processing mm. factory and just like fish comes down, chop it off, fish comes down, chop it off. And then that kind of descends into, you know, wherever it goes next. Yeah. Um, so my question is, how well do you think the industry is doing at telling those kind of stories where it's like you, like you were saying earlier, Gareth, um, it's not just um, things that kind of, bubble up within yourself unprompted it's the the big machine which yeah. you are just a tiny part of yeah um i don't i mean i think games are very interested especially indie games now in work and i think we're probably going to see a lot of then um, maybe games being more interested in the implications of work not just being interested in in the process of work right it's a kind of similar thing i think we've seen with kind of like 
the idea of extraction in games where the idea of just extracting a resource from a, from a node in an environment is something that was just a neutral part of games. And then over time, people have been like, well, wait a second. There's actually a whole politics and an ideology that surrounds this. And actually, what, what does it mean to, to, to think about a node in an environment as an infinite source of resource? Um, and so I think we're seeing like recently a lot of games surrounding that. And so I think now we're starting, beginning to see games that are kind of starting at that, I don't know, Stardew Valley place, right, where they're about work, they're about routine. Um, but I think we're, we're still quite far off from engaging with maybe some of the implications of, of work games or games that, that focus themselves on work and labor. Um, but a big inspiration for me was um, Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor. And I think one of the things that really struck me with that amazing game, which is a game where you, as the title suggests, you go around the spaceport picking up trash, and that's your job. Um, and you go home to your apartment and then write a diary, and then it's the next day. It's a wonderful game because it kind of combines the kind of colorful, exciting, bright science fiction with kind of like drudgery of, of like working a terrible job and the way in which it separates you from society as well, the way in which you feel, you know, everybody in the spaceport is arriving and taking on quests and buying expensive RPG like uh, swords or weapons to go into the dungeons beneath the city and you're just wandering around picking up their sweep wrappers. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly compelling game. And when I played it, I played the whole thing in, uh, over one night and it remind, I played it at a time when I was working that kind of job, and it reminded me so strongly. But what I loved about it was it also didn't say to me, oh, well, you can't access uh, this genre space of science fiction. You, you should only, there should only ever be heroes in science fiction. There should only ever be Commander Shepherds, and there should only ever be you know, people who succeed. And I was like, well, it's wonderful to see myself a failure <laughs> in a science fiction world. <laughs> um, and I found that really compelling, and I think that, that that feeling that we can have, we can kind of do both, right? That we don't have the, actually, as you say, all of us relate much more strongly to uh, difficulties that a game like Citizen Sleeper offers or other games, I think is like, yeah, well, we want people to relate to games and we want to tell stories about ourselves, not stories about this imaginary third person who always succeeds, you know, that I don't have anything to do with them. They don't have anything to do with me. So. I do think the games are, are moving in that direction, but I think in particular the relationship of labor and mental health and then structural structures has, has quite a way to go. I expect it will be addressed um, over time, especially as we see kind of like free to play style kind of currency mechanics and things moving into games, right? To the point where the newest Zelda game has a free to play style currencies in it, even if it's not free to play. And then I think we're going to see people then looking at the system and saying like, okay, but what do those mean? What do those say? And they mostly say things about work and they mostly say things about routine and about drudgery and about being forced to do things. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think it's a really potentially rich area, but I don't think that it's really being um, thoroughly kind of excavated at this moment. Thank you very much. I am mindful that we've gone over time and I know there's a a need for breaks, as we discovered in the burnout session. <laughs> so on that note, um, I, you know, it's been an absolute privilege sharing the stage with this amazing group of people, as you can imagine. And I'd just like you to join me in thanking them before we uh, depart. Thank you. Thank you.